us, and so we have a lot of great gospel truth contained in there. And, and as I was studying this, and, and these are passages we get so used to, and, and just how, how we can become accustomed to something, and we're used to saying it and hearing it, uh, but it just would seem very strange otherwise. It's amazing how, as humans, we can get used to something. Uh, when I'm out working in the barns or something, the, the pig smell or the cattle smell doesn't bother me bad, and then all of a sudden you come to the house and somebody else walks in, and you're like, whoa, that's, that's pretty offensive there. Uh, and, and the term we're going to talk about a lot today is the new birth. You must be born again. We sang about that. And as Christians, that's just something that rolls off the tongue of that. But do we ever stop and realize that sounds weird? If you, if you talk to somebody and, and they know nothing about Christianity, what do you mean I need to be born again? And that's the response that we get from Nicodemus here. It's, it, it's, very, it, it's very odd. Doesn't, doesn't working to, to please God. That makes sense. The human mind, that adds up. But this whole thing of being born again, that, that's kind of odd there. So we're going to be in John chapter 3 and studying the first 13 verses this morning. So I would ask you could stand with me for the reading of God's word. John chapter 3, and starting in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto ye, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Dear Lord, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the conversation between Christ and Nicodemus and the wonderful truth you revealed there. Please give us open ears and hearts to what you have for us today. Please guide my words. We love you. Ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're going to see this morning, born again, born of the Spirit, and born from above. So up to this point, John, his great theme is Christ as God. We've seen Christ as God, and now this chapter focuses on Christ as the Savior of the world. Last week, Christ drew attention to himself as the God of the temple. He showed, I am greater than the temple. I'm, I'm, I'm over all of this Jewish religious ritual. He did miracles in Jerusalem, and that drew people to him. Many people thought, wow, he, he's something. He, he's a great prophet, or, or there, there's something special about this guy. And they came. They believed in the works he did, but they did not believe on him as Savior, and therefore Christ did not fully receive them. They, he did not believe on them. He didn't commit himself to them. But now in chapter 3, we're going to see one man step out of the mob. He's going to come apart from them, and he's going to come, I believe, with genuine faith. And Christ is going to reveal something that's absurd to the human mind, but absolutely foundational to the gospel, and that is the new birth. So in verses 1 through 3, we're going to see born again. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So out of the crowds comes this one man, and he is a notable man. Nicodemus, it means either victorious or, or upright, and, and he fit his name. He, he was a Pharisee, and, and we know the opposition they had to Christ, and, and so we, we often look very poorly on the Pharisees, but in relation to receiving the gospel, the Pharisees had a lot going for them. They, in contrast to other sects, they believed the entire Old Testament as inspired. So they had all of the prophecies of Christ. They, they tried to live it out. 
And, and, and even though they went too far and put too many rules, they were very respected by the people for their eagerness and their zeal to, to try to live out what the law said. Uh, in contrast to the Sadducees, they, they believed in miracles. They believed in the possibility of the resurrection, and they were expecting the coming Messiah. So when you strip away all the things they added, a, a Pharisee in his training and his knowledge, he was in a good place to recognize the Messiah and be ready for him. And I believe Nicodemus was. But he wasn't only a Pharisee, he was a ruler of the Jews. Uh, you, Anybody, if you followed their rules, you, you could be a Pharisee, but, but he was a high up. He was on the council, the Sanhedrin. He, was a, he had a position of authority. He was a well-respected man. So this, this guy was something. And I find it interesting that he stands, with, with all his authority and power, he stands in stark contrast to Christ. Christ was, was of low birth. He was a little formal education that we know of. Uh, he was poor. He was from a, a bad town. But, but this... This great ruler of the Jews, he's coming to this humble prophet because he knows that he is sent of God. He comes in secrecy. The same came to Jesus by night. Christ did his miracles in public. He did it in the light. Christ was accessible by all. That's what he says to the Pharisees and, and the Romans and the mob when they came to arrest him. He says, didn't I speak in the temple? Didn't I act in the temple? Why are you coming to me at night? But this is the time that Nicodemus saw fit to come to him. Let's look at one potential reason why in John 12, 42. It might not have been easy for a Pharisee to come and see Christ in public. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Already, as we saw in their conversation with Christ, the Pharisees were skeptical of him. They were, they were suspicious. So uh, Nicodemus didn't want to risk his position in going to see Christ and, and being publicly associated with him. But also, in his normal daily goings about, Christ was thronged with people. There was always mobs about him, and Nicodemus wanted to have a serious conversation. So he waited until the people were gone. And that's why I think we get so much out of John chapter 3. When Christ is speaking to the, the masses, there's many unbelievers there, and he speaks in parables. That those who have ears to hear, they're going to get it, but the masses don't. But when he's speaking to his disciples, and now when he's got this truly believing Nicodemus one-on-one, -on -one, he can drill right down to the heart of the issue. He can be right out and coming out and saying things like, he must be born again. So this powerful ruler is coming in secret. He says unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So like the others in Jerusalem, it was the signs, it was the works of Christ that drew him to him. But there is more to Nicodemus' faith. He, he doesn't just realize, hey, these are signs and miracles and that's neat. But he says, you have got to be a teacher from God. I don't know that he understood that Christ was God at this point, but he, he at least had a genuine faith that, that God is going to reveal something through this man. Now, others spoke similar things to Christ if we look at Matthew twenty two sixteen. In Matthew twenty two sixteen, similar words are used but with a much different meaning. The others would flatter Christ. They would speak to him ingenuously. Matthew twenty two sixteen, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. So this, this is the Herodians. That's the politicians. They came to Christ and, and they were flattering him and, and trying to weasel their way in to trick him up. I, I think Nicodemus was a straight shooter. He said what he meant and he truly believed that Christ was, was somebody he needed to talk to, was sent from God because of these miracles. And he doesn't just say, I recognize this. He says, we know. As we saw in John 12, there were, there were multiple people among the leaders of the Jews that they were looking for the Messiah, and they realized that Christ was checking the boxes. They realized this Jesus of Nazareth, he, he must be the one that was prophesied. So they recognized him as a teacher and a prophet, even if not quite yet as the Messiah. And this is the point of Christ's miracles. Christ didn't do miracles to put on a good show, it, it wasn't an end of themselves, it wasn't just so he could have a big crowd of followers, but just like the, the miracles of the Old Testament prophets, this is to prove my message is true. 
The Jews require a sign. So Christ's ministry was to the Jewish people. They're used to, hey, if, if, if God is sending somebody, they're going to do a miracle to prove that they're a true messenger. So Christ is, is alerting the Jews, hey, I am a true messenger of God. You need to heed and hear what I am saying. Now, we never get to hear exactly why Nicodemus came. We, he never gets to say what he's looking for, but I think Christ already knew that. And so by Christ's reply, I think Nicodemus was looking for the kingdom. I think Nicodemus realized, hey, this is the Messiah. He's the one that's going to set up the earthly kingdom. He is going to, to rule and reign from Jerusalem. So I think that's what Nicodemus was looking for. He, he's coming to ask questions about this, but Christ knew this, and therefore Christ answered. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We see Christ talking about the second birth. This is the first time of three in this chapter that we have the double verily of Christ. He's saying, verily, verily, truly, truly. In the Greek, it's amen, amen. And John alone uses the two. The other Gospels, Christ will say verily once, but John emphasizes that Christ says, truly, truly, this is something you need to pay attention to. This is something you need to heed. Christ uses this 25 times in the Gospel of John, and as I said, three times in this chapter. And Christ, Christ can be blunt sometimes. He's not going to spend time with pleasantries here with, with Nicodemus. He jumps right to what's on his mind. He says, I, I know you're curious about the kingdom, but you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless ye be born again. Nicodemus, he wants to see the kingdom come. He might even want to offer his services. He wants to help set up the kingdom. But Christ says, you, you can't even see it. You can't even perceive the kingdom until you are born again, which is something you don't even know anything about. This, this respected Pharisee, this ruler of the Jews, this, this is the guy that had it all together, and even he could not see the kingdom of God unless he was born again. I think this is absolutely shocking to Nicodemus. He, he's taken aback. He's saying, not only are you saying, I can't see the kingdom of God, but, but what is this thing to be born again? What's this strange admission price to the kingdom? Let's see what Paul had to say about it in 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he doesn't use the term new birth, but Christ is really, or uh, Paul really talks about what Christ is getting at there. That when we come to Christ, there is something very special that happens. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Nicodemus, in the kingdom, all things are going to become new. And in order to get there, you are going to have to become new. You're going to have to have a total change, be born again. And the Greek word for again, that's not the, the usual word that just means afterwards. Um, it's got kind of a deeper range of meanings. A lot of people will say it means to be born from above. And it can mean that. But that's obviously not what Nicodemus heard. It, he, he wasn't thinking of a heavenly birth. So it, 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 can be, it can mean to be born anew. That it's not just a rehash of something. It's, it's something completely new and different. The new birth is regeneration, not reformation. It's not just fixing up and changing what you've got. It's getting something completely new. It's conversion. It's not just adjustment. If we are born once... Just physically born, we're going to die twice. We're going to physically die, and we're going to spiritually die for eternity in hell. But if we are born twice, if we are born physically and we're born spiritually, we will only face physical death, and there's going to be a generation of believers that don't even face that. Martin Luther said, My doctrine is not of doing or leaving undone, but of becoming. It is a change in nature. All human religion is about doing. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Christianity is about the new birth. It is about becoming something wholly different. It's about being born again through Christ. We see in verses 4 through 8 now, being born of the Spirit. So Christ has told him, you must be born again. In verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born Nicodemus takes this very literally. He, he ponders, how can I be physically born again to, to go into my mother's womb? And I think Nicodemus is expecting Christ to say, no, no, I, that, that's not really what I meant. 
And I think really he's hoping Christ will just drop this whole thing and, and let's go ahead and, and talk about the kingdom a little bit more. But Nicodemus's religion is physically focused. It's about physical cleanness. It's about physical washings. It's about doing all these things externally. And that's why he, he, his mind strictly goes to the physical birth. He has, he has no concept of the spiritual need which he has and the need that Christ is going to meet. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Christ refuses to be drawn off. Christ isn't going to uh, skip over this and get to something else. He comes right back to this new birth, to being born anew. Again, verily, verily, pay attention to what I'm saying to you, Nicodemus. This, this is the truth. This is something that you have got to know if you want to learn more here. This new birth, the, the double birth, this is absolutely necessary if you want to see the kingdom, if you want to get into the kingdom. And, and Christ does one better here. Before he said, if you're born again, you can see the kingdom, you can understand the kingdom. Now he's saying, Nicodemus, if you're born again, that you, you can get into the kingdom. You can experience the bounties and the blessings of the kingdom. It makes clear that there's two births here, the, the physical and the spiritual. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some people question about what is this being born with water. I can tell you what it's not. This has nothing to do with baptism. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, we'll get to in a, in a bit in John when it talks about Christ's disciples baptized, but Christ never baptized. If it was important for salvation, I think Christ would have done it. Paul later on talks about how uh, he says, I'm glad I barely baptized any of you. If it was important for salvation, I think Paul would have been baptizing anybody that would have come to him. So, so this is not about water baptism. That, that, that is totally apart from salvation. I believe that this is talking about the two births. To be born of water is, is speaking of the physical birth, that there, there's the, the breaking of water and, and the fluids there, and, and that's the physical birth, and then the spirit is, is the second birth. Now, there, there's some that see the water and the spirit are being two parts of the, the new birth. That the water represents the word of God, the, the washing, that, that when we open the word of God and we see the gospel and, and, and it convicts us, that, that we are going to realize that we need to repent of our sins, be washed of our sins, and, and then be saved by the spirit. So, either way there, I don't... I don't think that's a big issue as long as we're clear that being born of the water has nothing to do with baptism and then we need to be born of the spirit we receive spiritual life when you're born of a human parent a physical parent you receive physical life when you are born of the spirit you receive spiritual life this is accomplished by the holy spirit by his working and and he stays with us when we are born of the spirit the Holy Spirit resides within us. And either way, how you take the water, just as physical birth is going to require two parents, it requires a father and mother, spiritual birth requires, it's going to require the Word of God. Nobody's going to get saved just by having a, a spiritual experience, by just uh, coming to some special knowledge of God that they figure out on their own. We need the gospel to be instructed, but then we also need the working of the Holy Spirit to convict us, to, to change us, to bring in the new birth. And there's a few things interesting here when it says to, to be born, and throughout this, when Christ talks about being born again. Uh, the, the, these things, they're kind of implied in the verbs in the English, but, but they become very, very explicit when we look at them in the Greek. Every Greek verb, uh, between beginning parts and ending parts that are added to it, it tells us three things. It tells us tense, mode, and voice. Now with the tense, every time it talks about being born again, it's the aorist tense. And that's hard to get across in English, but aorist tense is all about it happens at one period of time. When something's aorist, it's not ongoing. And that makes sense with birth. Labor might be long, but, but a birth is a period of time. You, you can think of it as once for all. When you are born again, it's not something I'm getting born, I'm working and going about this. When you are born again, it is something that's done once and done for all. The voice, it could be active or passive. And we get that in English. All of these verbs are passive. It's something that's done to you. And once again, that, that's why birth is such a, 
a perfect uh, analogy here that, that you, when you're being born, you're, you're not helping at all. Uh, when I was born, I, I was two weeks early. I joked I had to get out and get, get doing some things, but, but I didn't help at all with the birth. I had a big square head. I, I was no help at all. So, so just like the physical birth, if, if you're going to be born of the Spirit, it's a thing that happens once, and it's a thing that is done to you. And, and then the mode is, is a little trickier. It, it's subjunctive, and that's Christ is putting emphasis on it, that it's a condition, that you need to have this done once for all, you need to have it done to you, and this needs to happen in order for something else to happen, in order for you to have admission into the kingdom. So these are some of the, the deeper things of this new birth that Christ is talking about. When a, when a child is born, it, it's not new matter being created. The mother needs to eat and drink and take in nourishment and it's existing matter, but it's turned into a completely new human being. Uh, when, when, when a child is conceived, there is a new genetic code that's never been before and never been again, and there's a new creature. Well, likewise, when we are born of the Spirit, we, we are an existing person, but we become a new creation. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is the new birth that Christ is talking about. And then he, 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 he kind of makes some distinctions here. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nicodemus is still solely focused on the physical. He, he's thinking of the things of the physical earth, and a physical birth is only going to produce physical things. The kingdom, it will literally come, but, but it is based on spiritual things. So a, a new physical birth is never going to lead to the kingdom. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. I'll be looking at Romans chapter 8 again this evening, but there, there's so much uh, in Romans chapter 8 that we want to look at, at, at just the novelness of the new birth that we have. Romans chapter 8, let's look at verses 7 and 8. And see, why do we need to be born again? Why is it not good enough that we just get a little bit better? Why can't we just be reformed in ourselves? Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We are physically born, we are born in the flesh, we are born with a sin nature, and that is at enmity, that is at constant war with God. It can never be placated, they're never going to come to an understanding, they're never going to come to some kind of treaty. The, the flesh, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Paul talks elsewhere about how in our flesh, just the knowledge that there's a law, there's something we can't do, that makes us want to do it more. This flesh, this sin nature, our physical body, this is not something that can be brought into right terms with God. We need something totally new. Verse 13 then in Romans 8. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you're only born once, and therefore the flesh is the only thing you've got, and you're living in that, you're going to die. Of course you'll die physically, but you're going to die spiritually. You're headed for hell. But if ye through the Spirit, if you are born again by the Spirit, that is the only way to mortify or to crucify the deeds of the body. We can try all we want. We, we want to do better. I try on my own power to, to say no to temptation, to say no to sin. I'm going to fail. As, as Paul talked about in Romans chapter 7, we're saying, I know what I'm supposed to do and I find myself doing the opposite. That's where we're going to be if we try to do it in our own strength. But by the Spirit, we have a new life. Therefore, we are able to crucify the deeds of the body, and therefore we have eternal life. We shall live. We cannot be renovated or improved enough to enter the kingdom of God and to enter his presence. We, we just cannot. We need to be made a new creation. It requires a new birth, a spiritual birth of a new spiritual nature to replace it. And 1 Corinthians 15 talks about a lot of that. That, that chapter is about the resurrection, but it talks about how we get so focused on the physical and how's our physical body going to rise. And he's saying there, there, there are so, there, there's something totally separate about it that we can hardly comprehend. But we need a spiritual existence. Christ says, ye must be. 
It's not optional. It's not, hey, this will make it easier. It would be a good idea if you were born again. That might be nice. It says this is the absolutely only way. The gospel of Christ is totally incompatible with, with, with any other religion, any other quote, gospel that somebody's going to offer. Because Christ says you must be born again. Man says you must work. Man says you must do such and such, or, or you must not do certain things. You must pray so many times a day and face the right direction. You must uh, have your good outweigh your bad. You must get reborn this many times through, uh, you, you might get born into something else. Christ is opposed to all of that. He says, ye must be born again. Peter uses this same terminology. If we turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And Peter actually invents a compound word. that He, he, he shoves the, the, the words together of, for born and again, that he makes a single word to be born again. But 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it's by the mercy, it's by the grace of God, it's not anything we have done to earn it, but by God's mercy and grace, he has begotten us again, but he doesn't just make us born again and say, here, have fun until you're with me, but he gives us hope. When we have the new birth, we have something to look forward to. We have a new life on this earth, but then just as Christ rose again, we know that we will rise again someday and be with him. Let's turn to verse 23, 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Corruptible seed. When I buy a, a bag of seed corn, there's usually a, a date when it says it was tested. Now, if I wait too long, that, that seed could die. If I plant it, it's not going to do anything. They say, uh, what Peter's saying here is, we don't have to worry about that. You don't, if you were saved early and, and you were living long into your life, and, and you may begin to wonder, well, is, is Christ going to come back? Do I have to worry about these things? He says, don't worry about it. You are born of an incorruptible seed. You have eternal life Nothing is going to happen to that. We are born again. Now, when we were in the, the room getting ready, Denny was kidding me a little bit about the, the song, You Must Be Born Again. He said, that's, that's a good Arminian song because it says, You must be born again, again. You must be born again, again. It kind of keeps going. But, but Christ says it once, that you must be born again. Nicodemus, when he was thinking of the new birth, he thought, how can I enter my mother's womb again? It's ridiculous. But I tell you this morning, it is equally ridiculous to think that we can be born spiritually again. If we are born spiritually, if we are saved one time, that is it. It's not something, oh, I, I lost it and I got unborn and now I've got to be reborn spiritually. That is just as absurd as thinking that we can be physically born again. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. The author really hits at this issue in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. And this is actually a, a favorite passage of Arminians or those who say you can lose your salvation. But, but if they would read it to the end, it has a sobering thought here. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Now this is saying if somebody could lose salvation, and I'm telling you this morning that we cannot. John 3, 16, when you are saved, you get eternal life. That is a current possession. John 10, 28 and 29, Christ says you're in my hands, you're in my Father's hands. There's no way we're getting out of that. Romans 8, 30 says that him who has been justified, if we've been saved in Christ, we are as good as glorified. We're saved. So we cannot lose our salvation. But this is speaking in a hypothetical here that says if that was possible... You, you, you can't fall away and come back. If you would lose your salvation, as many claim you can, th then that's it. You cannot be born again, again. They're saying if, if you receive Christ as your Savior and that wasn't enough to keep you saved and you got unborn, then there is nothing more for you. You cannot be born again a second time. 
So praise the Lord that we don't have to worry about that because we trust that when we are born, we stay born. That we cannot lose our salvation. But that's a sober warning to those that say that you can lose it because I would say invariably to all I've talked to that they believe that you could regain it. That's, that's strictly contrary to Scripture. We cannot be born again a second time. Therefore, praise the Lord that Scripture teaches that when we are born again, we stay born. We cannot lose our salvation. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Christ is saying, Nicodemus, you're not getting this. Let me try to put this in terms that you can understand. Let's think about the weather. And with all our technology, we still don't have a great handle on predicting the weather. This week, Monday night, Tuesday night, we were supposed to get rain. We got nothing here. And then Wednesday night, nothing was supposed to happen. And we got all but two inches of rain. So we, we still don't fully comprehend this. The wind blows. If, if, if I'm out spraying a field, we don't want the, the spray to get blown somewhere else. So you're supposed to check the wind. What direction is it going? And you start the field, it's going one way. And then all of a sudden, you see stuff blowing the other way. The, these things change. And we don't... We, don't, we can't see, oh, here comes a change in the wind. We can only tell what's going on by what it's affecting. And this is the point that Christ is trying to make, that Nicodemus, there are, there are some aspects of the physical birth, or of the spiritual birth, that you're just not going to get right now. It's like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't always know why it's blowing or why it does the thing it does, but you need to accept it. But what you can see are the effects. When there's winds, we can see it shaking the leaves on the tree. We see it blowing things around. Christ is saying there is going to be an effect of the new birth that will be undeniable. And, and we can kind of caught up, get caught up in our conceit and think that we can figure out everything about the new birth. And, and praise the Lord, the Spirit reveals a lot to us, but there are some times we're just going to have to say, I don't quite get that, Lord, but we trust Him. Just as He controls the weather, He controls these things, and we trust Him when we see in our lives and the lives of others the outworking of the new birth. That that person is not who they were before, that there is something changed and different about them. And actually, in, in both Greek and Hebrew, wind and spirit are, are the same word, pneumatos. So you think of pneumatics, you think of pneumatology as the study of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's the same idea, so they're a, a great example. They're both things that are invisible of themselves, but they are very, very powerful. Third, this morning, we're going to consider born from above. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Christ has given Nicodemus so much to try to digest and, and ponder. And Nicodemus is just like, Christ, how can this be? I don't, I don't get it. He, he, he finally doesn't have any more arguments. He's just like, I, I don't understand, Jesus. He just kind of has to shrug his shoulders and ask how. It's because he, he, he didn't understand the power of God to make us again. This is what Christ chides the Pharisees for in Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. 29. He says, ye err, knowing not the scriptures nor the power of God. He says, Nicodemus, you are so stuck in your physical religion that you don't get the spiritual things that I am saying to you. Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Christ kind of chides him. And this could be understood, aren't you the master of Israel? That, that it seems that Nicodemus was a highly respected teacher and, and one that, man, if you had a question, he was the one you would go to. And Christ is saying, you don't get this? Christ says, I'm, I'm, this is the basics here. I mean, shortly thereafter, we're going to get to John 3.16. That's, that's probably the most known verse in Scripture. That's, that's your starting point when you're sharing the gospel. He's like, Nicodemus, I'm going over the basics here with you, and you're not getting it, and you want all this kingdom truth. He's saying, I'm telling you, you're not ready for that. You need to understand this, the new birth first, before we get to that. And this finally seems to bring Nicodemus into submission. If you go throughout the, the next verses down to verse 21, it's all in red if you've got a red letter Bible. So from this point on, Christ is speaking. Nicodemus just zips his lip. He realized he doesn't have anything else to contribute to this conversation, so he just listens to Christ. That's a good example for us, that sometimes we're wrestling with something, and you're like, Christ, I, I don't get what you're doing in my life, or I don't get why this is happening, and sometimes we just need to be quiet and allow him to continue to work, to continue to speak to us. 
Christ says in verse 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Nicodemus, it doesn't matter if you believe it, if you understand it or not. This is the truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. Christ says, I'm trying to explain this to you, Nicodemus. You're, you're not falling, but, but that doesn't detract from the fact that this is the truth, that I'm saying something that I know everything about. Christ says, that he says, I, I witness that which I know. I know these things firsthand. I, I'm, I'm testifying them to you, and I am the supreme authority on them, so you need to believe my witness. And Christ makes clear that he is speaking a message directly from the Father. Let's flip back in John to 7.16. John 7.16. There Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Christ saying, I'm just not making this stuff up. This is the gospel of the Father. John 8.28. Then said Jesus unto him, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Nicodemus, this is coming straight from Jehovah. This is coming straight from the God that you and the Pharisees claim to worship and claim to revere so much. You need to listen here. Christ is saying that we speak these things. Now at this point, the disciples I don't think understood all this. So I don't think he's speaking of them. I think he's either speaking of himself and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was saying, hey, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Or Christ is saying, it's me and the Holy Spirit. That I'm speaking these words and the Holy Spirit's going to work to affirm them and bring conviction. But Christ is saying, I'm not alone in this. Because under Jewish law, you needed two or three witnesses to make sure something was true, to make a charge stick. Christ is saying, I'm not going off of myself. We have multiple witnesses, and we are speaking the truth. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He's saying, Nicodemus, you are, you're hung up on the kingdom. You're, you're asking about the kingdom. That's what you want us to be talking about. And, and that's in the future, Nicodemus. That, that's a heavenly thing. Yes, it's going to come to earth, but, but that is something that takes spiritual understanding and heavenly understanding. What I'm laying out for you now is the new birth. That's something that takes place on earth. That's something that's happening now. Nicodemus, I am using as, as basic human illustrations as I can. I'm putting it in terms of physical birth, which is something you get. I'm putting it in terms of the weather. He's saying, Nicodemus, if I'm putting this in your language, talking about things that are happening on this earth, and you don't get it, there, you, there's no way you're going to believe the heavenly things that I have to tell you. And we encounter that, that people are, people are curious about the deep truths of Scripture. They want to get into Revelation and say, what's going to happen at the end of the world? Or they want to get in on all these minute arguments. And sometimes we've got to say, you don't accept the earthly things. You don't accept the basics, the gospel of salvation. There's no way you're going to understand these heavenly things. If we don't first receive Christ as Savior, we don't receive the Holy Spirit within us, we are never going to be able to comprehend the heavenly things, and we will never be able to see them. We're not going to be able to enter the kingdom, as Christ says, unless we are born again. And no man ascendeth up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Christ is saying that, that without... The, the revelation from God, nobody can speak these things, nobody can understand these things. And he's saying, I am the only one qualified to speak of these heavenly things because I am the only one that came from heaven. He's saying, nobody else has ascended to heaven. A at this point, when, when, a, when a saved person in the Old Testament died, they did not go directly to the presence of God, as we see in, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. They, they are in Abraham's bosom. So nobody else had gone to heaven at this point. But Christ says, the Son of Man, I was in heaven and I have come down from heaven. So I am perfectly, I am uniquely qualified to tell you these things, Nicodemus. So don't go look into your Pharisee friends to figure this out. Go, go look into the law. You need to listen to me and what I have to say. Christ is still the unique authority. Because though many, uh, at this point since his death, many now go to heaven when they die, but Christ is the only one that came from heaven. He's the only one that came from the presence of the Father to earth in order to share how we may join him. 
That's what he's going to get into next week. He's going to talk about himself being lifted up. He's going to talk about his death so that we might be saved. We need to believe Christ in the earthly things because he alone is qualified to talk about them. Now, this, this idea of a new birth, this, is, this kind of messes with our mind. This is hard to understand. But what Francis Bacon, the great English scientist, he was one of the, the founders of the scientific method, how, how we figure things out in the human level, he says we need to expand our mind to God's mysteries and experience them, not try to squeeze God into our logic. That's what we try to do. We, we say, I, I, we're so advanced as humanity, we know how things work, and we try to fit God into our box of how we know things, whereas sometimes we need to push away the walls and say, God, you are so much above anything that we as mankind can do and understand and just pray for his wisdom to the degree that he would allow that we can understand the spiritual truths that he has for us. A recent study found, found that the more educated a person is, the higher education they have, the less likely they are to receive the Bible as the word of God. Unfortunately, our, our, we, 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 we just think as humans, we've got it all figured out. We don't need God anymore. We don't trust it at his his literal word. But with men like Francis Bacon, like Isaac Newton, who accepted the word of God at face value, I'd say we're in pretty good company. It's, it's amazing today, in this same survey, they were, they were asking people of different groups, do you believe the Bible is the literal word of God? 8% who, who would say that they are either evangelical or born again, they believe the Bible is just fables. I'm afraid they don't know what born again means. They are going to be in for a rude awakening. Another 52% that they think, well, there, there's the word of God in there, but they do not take it 100%. Once again, they're, they're going to have a rude awakening when they find out what it truly means to be born again. We saw here this morning that Christ was revealing something new to Nicodemus, but of course, this is a message that's very, very applicable to all of us. This is Christ laying the foundation of the gospel, which set up the entire age of grace that we are in. Nicodemus had everything going for him. He, he had perfect religious observance. He had genuine interest in Christ and his miracles and what he had to say, but this is not enough. He could not enter the kingdom because he and each one must be born again. We can't be renovated, we can't be fixed up, we can't do enough of ourselves, we can't work together with God to kind of maybe, well, I'll do some things and the Spirit will come alongside and do some things and that'll get me ready for the kingdom. We need to be a totally new creation by the power of the Holy Spirit from above. Then as a born-again believer, we shouldn't just live life business as usual. We have eternal life, we have that guaranteed, but we are a new creation even now. So as Satan comes and tempts, and the flesh comes and tempts as they will, we don't need to battle it on our own. We can say, I am a new creation in God through the Holy Spirit. Satan, you have no power over me. We have the power now to say no to that temptation. We have the power now to ex exercise the spiritual gifts we have, to serve the Lord. We're a new creation. We need to act like it. We've seen how we must be born again. That's a new creation. We've seen that we are born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit works this in our lives and He stays with us. We've seen how we are born from above. That this is the gospel of God and this is the one way to be able to ascend to heaven and meet God. If you're sitting here before me this morning, you were born at least once. You were born to a physical life. But I ask you this morning... Will you be born again, that you only need to die once, or will you stay born once and face the second death, the death of eternity in hell? Have you had more than an intellectual interest in Jesus? Has it gone beyond, gee, he was, he was a, a great miracle worker, he, uh, he, he said a lot of nice things. Have you truly met him as Savior, repented of your sins, received him as Savior, and been born again? And if you have, are you living out this new life? Are you just looking forward to eternity? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit even now in your life? You don't have to be burdened down with the sin and cares of this world. Yes, Satan and the flesh are going to come at you. They're going to try to tempt you, but you have the opportunity to live in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. Will you do that this morning? Will you commit to that today? Let's close in prayer.
Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the message of the new birth, Lord. We thank you that it's not incumbent upon us to work for it, that there's not things we have to do, that we, we don't have to reform ourselves, we don't have to get ourselves ready to meet Christ, Lord, but if we will just come and repent of our sins, that you will make us a new creation. We praise you for that, and we thank you for it. I pray if there's anyone here that has never made that decision, Lord, they have not been born again. They know in their heart that they cannot look to a time where they have repented of their sins and received you as Savior. I pray that they would change that tonight, that they would come to know you in personal saving faith and be born again. To each believer here, Lord, I know we all have challenges, we all have struggles, and I pray that you would help us to remember that we are a new creation. We don't need to do it on our own. We don't need to fight against Satan and sin of our own power, but that you give us the new birth, that we are a new creation, a new creature in you. Help us to remember that. Help us to rely on your spirit when the challenges of life come this way. Please guide and direct us all. Please work in our hearts and help us to be open to what you have for us. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Danny, will leave us in a